Okay. So um, my talk is going to be um, about something that's perhaps related to um, some of the ideas that uh, Emily was raising there about um, mathematics um, being a, a propositional um, way of knowing. Um, I'd like to talk about the opposite. Um, about non-propositional ways of knowing. So um, the, the idea that you're raising about uh, the triangle being about sort of um, adding up to 180 degrees. Um, so yeah, so, so I'd like to talk about the opposite of that. So, so uh, non-propositional rather than propositional ways of knowing. So I'd like to dedicate this speech, uh, first of all, to the, to the memory of Professor Michael Sugru. Um, whose lectures on philosophy were my introduction to so many of these ideas. Um, he was also the inspiration for creating the Arantian Philosophy Society. And he sadly passed away uh, last month in January from terminal cancer. Uh, he, was a, he was a great teacher and a lovely man. So I hope that his YouTube lectures will continue to inspire millions of people as they already have. So today I'd like to talk about dialectics of love. Um, in Plato's Symposium. So in our examination of dialectic, one of the first assumptions that we typically make is um, that dialectic is propositional. Um, in the modern Hegelian understanding of the term, uh, dialectic uh, involves three stages of propositional development, the idea of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Uh, and in the traditional Socratic understanding of dialectic as a method of refutation, propositions are put forward and negated uh, in order to distinguish between true and untrue statements. So I'd like to suggest that the idea um, that Socrates' method of dialectic is merely propositional may not necessarily be the case. Um, in what is beginning to be understood as uh, the third way of interpreting Plato, uh, Francisco Gonzalez opens up the possibility that um, Dialectic enables people to realise non-propositional ways of knowing. And this is also a topic that uh, John Viveki, one of our guest speakers at the Philosophy Society and uh, Professor of uh, Cognitive Science at the University of Toronto, explores in depth in his YouTube lecture series, After Socrates. So in this presentation, I'd like to offer an interpretation of Plato's Symposium, uh, one of the famous dialogues of Socrates, which, which examines how we can understand knowledge as non-propositional, practical, and um, reflective. So before we explore the symposium, I'd like to distinguish between these, uh, these terms. So according to uh, Gonzalez, if propositional knowing is uh, knowledge of what is the case, um, uh, and being describable. Non-propositional knowledge is, is, is knowledge of what is the case without being describable. So uh, Gonzalez expresses this mathematically. Um, he says, if, if propositional knowing is knowing X is Y, non-propositional knowing is knowing X. Uh, moreover, if, if propositional knowledge gives us beliefs, knowing that a proposition is true, non-propositional knowledge gives us skills, knowing how to do something. John Viveki also points out that propositional or semantic memory resides in a different area of the, of the brain uh, than non-propositional or procedural memory. For example, propositionally, uh, we, I, I know that a triangle has three sides and that its angles add up to 180 degrees. Um, in contrast, I would suggest that skills such as riding a bike or playing a musical instrument um, can't necessarily be reduced to a set of propositions and are therefore non-propositional. Um, similarly, I would like to suggest that our experience of love is also non-propositional. Uh, imagine needing your loved ones to, to prove your, their love for you in, in, in a logical proposition or like a, a mathematical equation or syllogism. I, no, I, I don't think it works that way. I, I know that I love my partner without needing to prove it logically. Uh, instead, I try and understand how to love her in a way that we can appreciate together. So one of the first examples of um, non-propositional knowledge that we're made aware of in Plato's Symposium is that the story is a recited account from Apollodorus, who has committed the dialogue to memory, demonstrating his skill as an orator. And this is to encourage us to appreciate the importance of the dialogue, which is true of all great oral traditions. Uh, Apollodorus himself wasn't actually at the symposium and is instead reciting an account of the events which he heard from Aristodemus. So there's a great deal of artistic license being taken here by Plato. Um, I might even suggest that the, the structure and the composition of the symposium is informed by its oral nature. Michael Sugru uh, even suggests that it has a kind of musical flow to it, with each speaker either raising or lowering the tension in their statements. And this is made even more evident by the fact that there were speeches that have been forgotten, perhaps in the same way that a composer might uh, redact or refine their work for more sort of emotional impact, such as Brahms' first piano trio. 
Nietzsche once said that it is my ambition to say in ten sentences what others say in a whole book. Similarly, Apollodorus' skill of knowing how to refine his account is reflected in how impactful and memorable the text is. So think about how short the symposium is. It's only about 50 or so pages long. Um, I'd also like you to think about the subtext behind all of these speeches. There's a sort of unspoken attraction towards Eros, which gets stronger as we progress through the, through the dialogue. Uh, it's also worth noting that the symposium is a kind of uh, philosophical drinking party, so accompanying this increasing attraction to the knowledge of love and wisdom is an attraction to drunkenness and to bodily pleasure. And the tension between these ideas will sort of push and pull one another throughout the dialogue like centripetal forces. Uh, and these unspoken opposites will encourage us to understand each of these speeches dialectically, as Michael Sugar teacher um, Alan Bloom explains in his essay, The Ladder of Love. That this distinction between the speakers is represented in the dialogue by the fact that the first three speakers are poor drinkers and turn out to be less erotic, and that the two poets and the philosopher who follow are good drinkers and more erotic. So there's a, a dialectic established between these rhetorical speeches because they contradict one another, and one must try to resolve the contradictions in order to get any kind of coherent account of them. So our first speaker, Phaedrus, uh, suggests that love is a god. He says that when Homer speaks about a god breathing might into some of his heroes, this is just the effect that love has on lovers. Plato suggests that we are the playthings of the gods. We fall prey to anger, to lust, to ideas, to all kinds of temptations that may be described as a kind of possession. Phaedrus suggests that Eros, the god of erotic love, inspires us to do virtuous things. Returning to Gonzales, how should we realise this as non-propositional knowledge? I would suggest that rather than just mere inspiration, the personification of love as a god or a spirit opens up the possibility to relate to love, um, just as our relationships to other people show us how to love. And many of the world's religions emphasise this idea of a relationship, either with a god or to the teachings of a spiritual path, as the beginning of virtue and wisdom. So in Buddhism, for example, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, writes um, in his introduction to Buddhism, the, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the way to the end of suffering, that the pursuit of a spiritual path is not like selecting a new suit of clothes. To select a new suit, one need only try on a number of suits and inspect oneself in the mirror and select the suit in which one appears most attractive. The choice of a spiritual path is closer to marriage. One wants a partner for life, one whose companionship will prove as trustworthy and durable as the pole star in the night sky. Similarly, in uh, Christianity, the book of Proverbs depicts a personification of wisdom calling out to all of humanity, saying, choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. So notice the comparison in these spiritual traditions between desire or attraction and the emphasis on the choice to follow wisdom or a spiritual path. And so this emphasis on autonomy rather than impulsive passion and inspiration will become more important later on in the dialogue when we come to examine the differences between the characters of Socrates and Alcibiades. The next speaker, Pausanias, uh, builds upon Phaedrus' speech by emphasising the role of virtue and autonomy in our understanding of love. Separating the love of bodies and the love of souls, he says that a bad man is the lover of the common love, lo loving the body rather than the soul. And this distinction of, uh, between love of bodies and souls will become increasingly important as we move upwards on Plato's ladder of love. Uh, and again, the important thing to consider is, is the increase in sort of tension, that musical tension, which is always present in the subtext of these speeches, allowing us to realise this as non-propositional knowledge. So this idea of musical tension is explored even further in the speech of Eryximachus, a physician who argues that music itself is the language of love and beauty. Music speaks to us, he says, of, of creating a well-ordered soul, just as Eryximachus, in his role as a physician, is concerned with creating well-ordered and healthy bodies. A healthy soul exists in harmony with itself, just as a healthy body requires the gratification of wholesome desires and avoiding overindulgence. This is a notably unerotic account of Eros, in contrast to the highly erotic speech by the comic poet Aristophanes, who follows on from Eryximachus, who has uncontrollable hiccups, which are a sort of embodied demonstration of his comic speech. Um, and uh, this demonstrates his vulnerability, which comments and contrasts with this rather serious account of love which Eryximachus gives. 
Uh, some scholars suggest that this is due to Eric Simicus' understanding of the human body as a physician would, as somewhat mechanical and therefore sort of unerotic. For Eric Simicus, technique takes, takes the place of love. So the distinction between uh, these speeches, uh, between knowing how to love and knowing love itself. Both of these speeches encourage an embodied and perspectival understanding of them, which is another form of non-propositional knowledge. And I would like to suggest that these opposing and contradictory perspectives should therefore be approached dialectically. Uh, likewise, harmony, um, according to Eric Simicus, is, trying to um, is about finding the right balance between opposing principles. Uh, he says, surely there can be no harmony between opposites while they are still divergent. Harmony is concord, and concord is a kind of agreement. Just as medicine creates agreement in one area, music creates it in another, by implanting love and concord between the elements involved. Music is knowledge of the forms of love in connection with harmony and rhythm. So back to Gonzalez. How do we recognise the workings of love in music as non-propositional knowledge? I'd like to turn our attention to one of Benjamin Britten's Hodelin fragments, uh, Socrates and Alcibiades. The song begins with Alcibiades questioning Socrates about beauty. The piano line begins with a sort of broken augmented D chord, um, and the voice of Alcibiades joins the piano. Uh, on the score is the marking freely. Um, both lines seem to be somewhat talking past one another, exploring harmonic changes in a free and impulsive manner. Socrates' response, in contrast, is met by the establishing of a full D major chord in the piano, in contrast to the broken and sort of wandering augmented D chord at the beginning, suggesting that the arrival to the harmony and order of D major, like the harmony and orderliness of Socrates' soul, has been waiting there all along. The dynamic is reduced from mezzo forte to piano, creating a feeling of intimacy. And when the love of beauty is finally mentioned at the end of the song, the dynamic is reduced even further to pianissimo, and this is the climax of the whole piece, bringing us even more intimately with the love of beauty itself. Notice also that the piano texture changes from monophonic to homophonic, giving order and structure to the chords, just as Socrates' soul is ordered and beautiful. I'd like to suggest that all the claims I've just made about this music are not founded in explicit propositions from the composer, but an interpretation of the music as a metaphorical language, so-called word painting, uh, by which Benjamin Britten is able to convey the meaning of the Hodelin poem beyond what the words are able to communicate propositionally, uh, knowing that they are true or false, but rather in their delivery as a musical performance, knowing how to sing them. So metaphors have this ability to sort of blur the boundary between propositional and non-propositional um, thoughts. It might even be worth suggesting that metaphors are non-propositional language, allowing us to blend the meaning of propositions together without necessarily making logical sense. Instead, metaphor gives us this ability to sort of hallucinate a kind of conceptual synthesis. Uh, this syllogism demonstrates how metaphors function in this way. Uh, my eye is something I see through. A window is something I see through. My eye is a window. Obviously, syllogistically, this doesn't make sense as a logical proposition. My eye isn't really a window. But I would suggest that it works perfectly well as metaphorical language, insofar as metaphors can join many meanings together, which Michael Sogru describes as polyvocal language, saying many things at once, rather than the univocal X is Y language of propositional logic, allowing us to engage in a greater capacity for symbolic thought and expression. I'd like you to think for a moment why you love your favourite music so much. What is it exactly about the music that makes you so emotionally invested in it? Uh, we dedicate so much time to it for, for reasons I would say that we can't explain very well in propositional language. Uh, the best the Greeks could do is speak about this uh, in, in, in metaphorical or, or, or religious language, that the gods of music, the muses, inspired us to come into a living relationship with love and beauty. Moreover, Michael Sugru would say that all religious language gives us the ability to express symbolic thought in a language of images rather than logical propositions. So one example of this use of imagery is the concept of Prometheanism, which we recently discussed at the uh, CPRC, which epitomises this Greek attitude to rebel against the gods with the image of Prometheus stealing the divine fire from heaven and giving it back to humanity. As Stephen Fry says, the myth of the Prometheus teaches us that we have the fire, that whatever is divine is in us, 
As humans, we are like the gods. We are as capricious and mean and stupid and jealous and all the things that Greek mythology show that they are. Prometheus shows us that we are the captains of our soul and the masters of our destiny and that we contain any divine fire that there is. So in this way, metaphor, as expressed in the world's great mythologies and religions, uh, gives us a variety of symbolic languages to use when speaking to one another about the most important aspects of the human spirit. So after all of our speakers have had a chance to lay out their arguments about love, Socrates enters the conversation. Although he's deeply engaged with the philosophical discussion, he's somewhat disengaged with the drinking party going on. Alan Bloom writes that Socrates is equally good at both drinking and not drinking, unaffected by drinking or abstinence. And one of the things that provokes envy of Socrates is his indifference to the things that affect other people most powerfully. So for me, this is another non-propositional and embodied demonstration of the fact of Socrates' organised, uh, untouchable soul. And this is in stark contrast to Alcibiades, who later on arrives at the symposium very drunk and is concerned with bodily pleasure, yearning to make love to Socrates' body, which would represent a kind of defeat of Socrates' argument that an everlasting love is the love of souls and not bodies, and uh, that love is the desire to have the good forever, and not just for a single moment of bodily passion. And these are another example of opposing and embodied perspectives which we can approach dialectically with, as Nietzsche says, uh, one perspective through the mouth of a divinely inspired prophetess and the other under the inspiration of wine. So given the many perspectives which are offered in this symposium, it should not be surprising that this was one of Nietzsche's favourite works, which uh, Francisco Gonzalez suggests was highly influential in his doctrine of perspectivism. At the centre of Socrates' argument is the retelling of an account of love that comes from a wise prophetess called Diotima. It's quite clear from his account that Socrates loves Diotima and that she taught him the ways of love, again, knowing how uh, is emphasised here. Um, but in the, in the lead-up to his account of Diotima, Socrates engages in a kind of halfway dialectic with the previous speaker, Agathon, uh, who is hosting the symposium um, and is himself a famous tragic poet. So the dialectic puts Agathon into a state of aporia, where he is recon uh, he's forced to reconsider his way of thinking. He says, I can't argue against you, Socrates. Let's accept things as you, as you say. Uh, and Socrates replies, it's the truth you can't argue against. It's not difficult to argue against Socrates. So John Vivekey, uh, in his attempt to reverse engineer the Socratic method, argues that aporia, being forced to reconsider our beliefs, is one of the main goals of dialectic. Um, Vivekey cites Vasilis Politus, who claims that the search for knowledge for Plato depends on aporia, which for Vasilis means a radical reorientation of the soul. What's more, Diotima describes the spirit of love as that which constantly seeks a state of aporia. So in other words, a dialectic of love causes a radical reorientation of the soul. I'd like to encourage you to think of dialectic in this way, also as a non-propositional skill, with the emphasis on knowing how to think dialectically and to produce aporia, rather than knowing that a proposition is true or false. Moreover, I would suggest that we should also think of the previous speeches made in praise of love in this way, such as the differences in eroticism between Eryximachus and Aristophanes, or the differences in that sort of musical tension between Phaedrus and Pausanias, or the opposing perspectives of Socrates and Alcibiades. I'd also like to suggest that what enables Socrates to encourage Agathon upwards on the ladder of love through dialectic is that Socrates himself is committed to the golden love of beauty and wisdom. Remember at the start of this talk I, I spoke about how love itself is non-propositional, that you can't necessarily put into words why you love the people who are closest to you or why you love a piece of music so much. You simply know that you do. Uh, likewise, I would go as far as to suggest that what is guiding Socrates' process of reason in this way, the non-propositional is guiding the propositional. Uh, knowing how to think is informing knowing what to think. As Socrates finishes his speech, Alcibiades bursts into the symposium. He's described as being a very attractive man. He's proud of it, in contrast to Socrates, who is described as resembling the appearance of a satyr. Alcibiades, rather than making a speech in praise of love, gives a eulogy in praise of Socrates, just as Marcius the Satyr plays attractive and hypnotic melodies on his flute, Alcibiades is overwhelmed and spellbound by Socrates' speeches, as though they were an attractive rhetoric like that of the sophists, rather than a hard-earned dialectical skill. 
He wants to lay with Socrates, but he's, he's prevented by Agathon. Socrates demands that um, Alcibiades' intention to sleep with him is a poor trade-off, that he's in exchanging gold for bronze, the golden love of truth, beauty, and goodness in exchange for immediate bronze bodily pleasures. In the end, despite all of Socrates' efforts, Agathon moves aside, and the attractive Alcibiades wins the heart of the crowd, and they all turn to bronze desires, drinking vast amounts of wine. Socrates tries desperately to engage them all once more in a philosophical discussion about the, uni uh, the unity of tragedy and comedy, but they've all become too tired to care. All of them decide to exchange gold for bronze, even after being so convinced by Socrates' reasoning to pursue the love of wisdom over the pursuit of pleasure. So think about that for a moment. If, if reason alone isn't enough to convince people to pursue the philosophical life, then, then what does it take? So then the question Plato leaves us with at the end of the symposium is this. What makes the difference between Socrates and Alcibiades? What gives Socrates the ability to choose gold over bronze, to choose this golden standard and not to be led astray by the bronze pleasures? I would say Plato leaves it an open question, but perhaps gives us a clue in the Apology of Socrates, where Socrates claims to have a daemon, a spirit whose voice comes to him and always forbids him to do the things that tempt him. Strangely enough, Diotimus says the same thing about love that is also a daemon, a great spirit which binds us with the good forever. Socrates, then, uh, is the man who is most powerfully attracted to the good, just as Eros is the most powerful attraction to the beautiful. Michael Sugru, in his final lecture on the symposium, reveals that Socrates is a unique kind of hero. It turns out that Socrates is in disguise. He's not really human, nor is he a god, but is a powerful spirit which mediates between heaven and earth. He is the spirit of love. So notice how Michael Sugru uh, knows how to use metaphorical or religious language to speak about the most important aspects of Socrates. Michael, I would say, was a, a fluent Platonist and spoke to us uh, at the Philosophy Society about how, for him, Platonism existed as its own spiritual tradition alongside the Christianity he grew up with. And both Christianity and Platonism gave Michael the ability to speak with fluency in opposing vocabularies consisting of the images of both Jerusalem and Athens, the traditions of faith and reason, uh, opposites he knew how to synthesize through a process of dialectic, united by the spirit of love. Ultimately, the story of the symposium shows us uh, that love should guide reason. And the orderly and virtuous soul should be oriented towards the spirit of love. That an orderly, beautiful soul, guided by the light of love, is necessary for a sane and rational mind. After all, rationality means to ration and organise our thoughts and to put everything in its proper place. So perhaps the first step in creating a beautiful soul, then, is to know how to furnish the mind with beautiful beliefs which will help light up the path to the pursuit of love. In the words of the late Michael Sugru, reason is a good servant and a bad master. What we ultimately serve is love. Thanks very much. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Go for it. Could you just uh, say that last bit again? So, yes, so instead of reading so my gloss on that, hmm. is that a reading that you would accept, or is it fundamentally not consistent with the way 
Uh, so my, my, my way of reading it is to try and uh, look at it through, um, what would you say, uh, the, the lens of this idea of it being a language of images. So you have these, these images of, 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 you know, of, of gold and bronze, all this sort of stuff. So um, linking it more to, towards that idea of, of, of um, uh, you know, putting it into um, a frame where you're looking at it through uh, the lens of metaphor and, and this kind of thing, rather than saying that you know, we, we, we know these things are absolutely you know, uh, true. It's just a, uh, my, my reading of this is very suggestive and uh, tries to, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a Plato scholar, by any means, I was just you know, <laughs> just to put that out there, um, you know, I'm just uh, approaching this with my own limited perspective. Um, I, I would say you could uh, have an uh, interpretation of my own perspective on this being informed by my own background and all, all this sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not making any final uh, definitive comments about the symposium. I'm just making a, a suggestion as to what it could mean. But yeah. <laughs> hmm. Any more questions? To what extent do you feel like the um, being Christianity not a lover okay, is the, the same as not really present in Judaism and historical Christian Christianity? Christianity is very compatible with, um, with, with the thoughts of Athens. There's no visual symbol for the belief system of Athens, whereas there is for Christianity. There's no like, you, know, you can't wear, like, I'm an Athenian on a, on a chain. So there's a lack of, like, a direct visual representation of the, of the thought in Athens. Including, for example, like love is described as being gold, it, because there's no way of drawing a picture that would present it. So when you're talking about visual metaphor, there's a lack of actual visual metaphor for these things, and it seems like maybe the Greeks felt like the things that they couldn't produce visual metaphor for were the things that were truly divine. Mm. To what extent would you agree? With that? I, I would say that for Plato, I know that he um, visited the um, Eleusinian mysteries, which were a way of um, you know, engaging with this sort of underlying uh, religious imagery um, to do with uh, the, the, the Greek philosophy that was coming out of Athens. So there, there, there is a sort of, and Plato remarked on that saying that it was, um, there was something very, very true and real about these, uh, the experience there, the uh, Eleusis. Um, and uh, with having spoken to um, Karl Ruck, who was one of the authors of the, the Road to Eleusis, um, uh, you know, one of the experts on the Eleusinian mysteries, um, he was basically saying that um, what was it? Uh, the, the the ritual uh, that was part of the the experience of the mysteries was a kind of indoctrination into the sort of religious imagery that would be experienced there. So it's very interesting how the um, the 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 um, the idea of visual representation in, in, in images uh, overlaps with the sort of mythology of ancient Greece, like with the idea of Prometheanism um, being a sort of representative of the sort of Athenian uh, tradition. The idea of um, you know the, well, perhaps in the uh, you could you could apply that to, to dialectic as well with the idea of the struggle of opposites. With um, I think we reread uh, Baggio recently with the idea of the, the infinite and the finite as, as opposites, and uh, with Prometheanism as a sort of way to uh, tag on to that is the idea that um, the, 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 um, you know, we, we struggle against the gods and you know, this, there's, there's a sort of struggle between opposites there. So uh, a, lot, a lot of this um, symbolic language um, from the Greek tradition can uh, you know, be, be used as a way into it. Um, yeah, anyway. Okay, I'll have to draw it to a close now, I'm afraid. <laughs>